If I ask you which of these two user interfaces look better, what will be your answer? Pause the video and comment down below. I know you'll say that, Sapta, what's there to think? The second one looks much better than the first one. And you are right. But let me ask you why? Why is it better? You know what? Most people can't answer this why part. And that's the reason they struggle to create an effective and good looking user interface. To help you with this, I'm going to share with you seven UI design hacks that can save you countless hours in your design projects. And the second one is my favorite. If it's my favorite, why is it the second one? Why not the first or the last? Anyways, number one is the 60 30 10 rule. When you use colors and contrast, you can highlight the importance of information effectively. And that's where the 60 30 10 rule comes into play. It simply means that it's a good practice to split the colors in your screen that you are designing in the ratio of 60% for the dominant color, 30% for the secondary one and 10% for the tertiary or accent color. Here is an example of the same design that doesn't follow the 60-30-10 rule and the same design that follows it. The differences are clear. What if your screen has more than three colors? Well, this rule doesn't say anything about it. Maybe if I were to extrapolate the rule, maybe it's a subtle hint that you shouldn't ideally use more than three major colors in your design. I'm not saying it. So roughly 60% of the dominant color, which is your primary color, covering the majority of the space. It sets the overall tone of your design and should be relatively neutral or background color that doesn't overwhelm unless there's a need to make your design look overwhelming. These are most often in the territory of white for light modes and black for dark mode. And then roughly 30% for the secondary color that supports the dominant color and adds some visual interest to it. It should contrast with the primary color to create a visual striking effect, but not so much that it competes for attention. I've often seen brand color used as secondary color by many companies. And roughly 10% the accent color, which is reserved for important elements you want to highlight. This splash of color draws the eye and guides users towards key interactions or information or simply for visual styling. Imagine you are dressed in all black, but you choose to have your socks and the band of your watch as bright orange. That's accent. I've seen many companies using their brand colors as accent colors in case they haven't chosen it as their primary or secondary colors. In such cases, they use accent color for buttons and stuff like that. Now, here's a contradiction. If you see popular apps like Gmail or YouTube or even Instagram, you will see this rule is not followed. Why not? How could they not do it? Well, you don't need to do it every time. At times, it could be challenging to do, or maybe it's not even needed to be done. For example, you simply can't do it in a platform like YouTube or Instagram where most of the app is user-generated content and the overall look and feel around colors are determined by what users are posting. Also, in a productivity app like Gmail, excessive use of colors may actually be distracting. So it is majorly made with white with just accent colors for various use cases, and it is still looks pretty good and usable, which means 60, 30, 10 rule is not the only way to make things look good. It is just a starting point if you are clueless. You know, there's another similar phenomenon which is called 70, 30, and it's a very, very sad phenomenon. It's actually a sad fact. If you like my videos, I request you to please hit that subscribe button. It motivates me to create more content for you. All right, the second hack is balanced typography. Balanced typography improves readability and helps users skim through the content more easily so that they can digest the information quicker. Additionally, concise and well-organized text helps the user receive clear instruction throughout the interface. For example, look at the sample homepage. It has an image on the right, some text and button on the left. A typical layout for web pages like this. Now, this has way too much of text for my liking. I would ideally want to remove some of it if not most, but I may not have the liberty to do that all the time. So what do we do? That's where a balanced typography comes into the picture. Now, have a look at the slightly tweaked version of the same. Looks miles ahead, right? I've not done anything special to it. I just tweak the font sizes, line heights, colors, and contrast. That's it. And it already starts looking so much better. This is what even the most basic knowledge of typography can do to your designs. Look at this. For most of it, I've actually reduced the sizes of the fonts and yet things are more prominent in this one. This one is organized, which is making it much easier to scan through the content one thing at a time. It is very clear that you'll mostly look at this first and then this followed by this and if you're finally convinced you will mostly click on that button. The key here is to make sure you have sufficient distinction between the different elements so that you can pave a path 
the order in which they will read. And it's not just about the size of the text, it's also about the character spacing, line height, color and contrast. I've seen a lot of people making mistakes around line spacing. Let me tell you a rule so that you'll never make that mistake again. If you refer to the OG books around typography, you will often find it mentioned that the line height should be around 1.5 times the size of the font. That is, if the font size is 20, the corresponding line height should be 30, which is 1.5 times or 20. But this is not completely relevant in the digital world where screen real estate is often limited. In the digital world, you will see that the larger the font size, the smaller the multiplying factor of line height gets. For example, if you take a text with size of 64, which is big, and if you add a line height of 96, which is 1.5 into 64, you will see that the spacing feels too much. So for large font sizes, you should use a smaller multiplying factor to get the line height. Around 1.2 or 1.3 works just fine. And when multiplying, if you ever get a decimal number, feel free to just round it off. But remember that for smaller font sizes, the multiplying factor of 1.5 works just fine. Smaller, I mean body text, that is sections that have a lot of text. There, you need the relatively larger 1.5 line spacing for comfortable reading. And if you're finding this video useful so far, consider hitting that like button. The third hack is consistent alignment. Consistent alignment of element makes clear visual patterns that users can easily follow. It also creates a sense of order that helps user understand complex information better. If you look at the same example that we had seen before, this entire text group is aligned to the left against an imaginary vertical line. Even the meta logo is aligned in the same vertical line. Same story at the right side as well. These tabs at the top right are aligned to another imaginary vertical line and this image of the Quest 3 is also optically aligned to the same line. One of my favorite examples of great alignment is in the App Store app of iPhones. If you see the Games or the Apps tab, there are multiple widgets which are horizontally scrollable. In each of these horizontally scrollable widgets, you will see the leftmost edge of the next one peeking from the right side. Now, as you scroll down the page, you will see that the amount of peak is always the same for all these widgets, no matter what the content is. These widgets have different kinds of content, small, medium, big, but they have kept the alignment of the peaking consistent throughout. Of course, there are some exceptions to it like this one, but wherever possible, they have maintained it. Now, this is not just about being or looking perfect. When things are correctly aligned like this, it reduces cognition and that makes it much easier for the user to scan through and understand. This is particularly useful and important in pages like this where you have a lot of content to show. The fourth hack is related to UI spacing. Margin spacing, padding, and placement ensure that users understand and focus your key message or elements in the UI. These are also essential to make the UI look professional and clean. More than how much the margin and spacing values are, it is about defining one certain rule for your project and sticking to it throughout. For example, it's a good practice and also a common practice to have around 16 pixels of margin on both left and the right side of any mobile design. Now, based on your requirement, this value could be 16, 12, 20 or anything else that you feel suitable for your design. The point is to be consistent with the same values across all the places of that project. If you pick 20 pixels as your left and right margin, so be it, but make sure you stick to it. Similarly, you would also write rules around the spacing between different elements within the UI, horizontal or vertical. Always make a note that that these rules are not as simple as defining some numbers. These can vary depending on what kind of elements you're defining spacing for. Let's take the example of filters. The most important thing to consider while defining the spacing between them is to make sure that they are comfortably tappable. That is, you don't end up accidentally tapping one while actually attempting to tap another one. Once that bare minimum is established, the rest of it is to ensure that the UI doesn't feel cluttered or too spaced out. If they are rectangles with rounded corners, you may need to have a certain amount of spacing between them. But if the same filters are completely rounded on the corners like a pill, you may take the liberty to reduce the spacing a bit. This is because by the virtue of its shape, there is some amount of natural optical spacing that is already present in a pill. So before recklessly defining any of these rules and numbers around spacing, take some time out, think and analyze what could be the different challenges that you will encounter and what different elements you will have in your UI. The fifth hack is consistent icons. Consistency among icons minimize the need for users to learn and interpret each icon individually. 
They can quickly scan familiar icons and understand the context and their function importance, saving time and effort. It helps in creating an interface that looks more coherent and tailored. It's okay to use multiple styles of icons within a single app, but you should always stick to one style for one purpose. For example, if you use line icons for unselected state of the bottom navigation, you should continue using that. You should never mix styles there. And even within a particular style, make sure that all the icons are consistent and feel like a part of the same family. I've often seen sets of line icons made by people which are sure line icons, but they don't feel like they're a part of the same family. The thickness of the line of the line icons and the overall styling are very different. Please don't make that mistake. This probably happens when people download these icons from different sources, which is okay, but make sure that after downloading them, you work on top of it to bring the layer of consistency which is needed for your design. The second biggest mistake that I see people making around icons is adding too many details to it. While designing icons, people don't realize that these are going to be very, very small size. The trickiest part about designing icon is getting them to clearly represent something with as few elements as possible. You should embrace the principle of abstraction. When you're making an icon, start with a pen and paper. Sketch out the most basic element you need to capture the essence of what you're trying to represent. After you have got down something, take a good hard look. Question every line and shape you have put together. Try stripping them away one by one and see if your icon still communicates what it is meant to. Keep doing this until the moment you remove something and it suddenly doesn't quite feel like what you were drawing. That's when you stop. Google has put together some detailed documentation for its material design icons and I highly recommend checking them out. I will leave the link in the description for you. The sixth hack is repeating consistency. It's all about increasing consistency and the user's ability to learn your interface. It reduces confusion when we add repeating elements and patterns to our layouts. Have a look at this. These all are listings for items on sale. Now, if all or some of them have a different layout and structure, users might have a feeling that they belong to different categories or class or something else. Because if they're indeed similar and at the same level, they should look and feel the same, right? Now, have a look at this. We made all the listings consistent, which makes it very clear that they all are similar shoppable options which can be picked from without having to think if they're same or different or anything. Anything else. Now, the reverse of this hack is also true. If you indeed want to create some differentiation between these listings, for example, something might be a new launch or a recommended item or a bestseller or anything different, you can break the consistency to make that item stand out. And the final hack is instant makeup. To enhance the overall user experience, you can simply use grid templates where a design layout is divided into structured systems of rows and columns. Depending on your content and design needs, you can use grid lines to evenly position elements and by doing so you can create well-organized and user-friendly interfaces in very less time. Now this is not really a hack but a good practice. A practice that if you get used to it you will want to keep using it again and again because it gives you visual reference when you're moving your elements and it can be of great help. I'm a hardcore user of 4 pixel grid whenever I'm designing for mobile interfaces. Some people even take a step ahead. They also define sections within the screens where they plan to keep elements. This is more common with designing for desktop web though. For example you can divide your screen into certain number of vertical sections. Let's take eight for instance. You can also define some spacing between the section. Now, when you are designing your layout, you can use various combinations of these vertical sections to define the size of your element. You can keep the extreme left and right sections as margins. You may choose to combine the next three sections on the left for your text and the three after that for your image. You can even use each of the single vertical space for one single element, make a grid using that and so on. You can even combine two of these for one element and keep a single one for the third element and continue with that approach to have a bento box kind of design. This essentially becomes a flexible but well-defined template that you can keep using. These were the seven UI design hacks that you had to know about. But remember, these hacks won't magically elevate your designs. You should be cautious about using only the hacks that fit your need. Please like and share this video with your fellow UX designers and hit the subscribe button. It motivates me to create more content for you. Now, if you're interested in my design journey, you can have a look at this video where I talked about how I got a high paying UX design job. And if you are looking for free resources to boost your design skills in 2024, don't forget to check out this video of mine.